You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. Hi, this is Jim. So we're going to talk about Nightmare Before Christmas. Welcome. What is this place? Nothing ever happened. We're going to bring ghosts from all over the world. Join us. The children are screaming. And we guarantee them creaky doors and creaky floors. Be sure to bring your death certificate. Take your pixie out of your pockets, Neverlanders. Sprinkle some pixie dust around. Think that happiest and spookiest of thoughts as we fly away to Neverland one more time to hear from Jim Corcus about The Nightmare Before Christmas. If you didn't hear part one of this one, make sure you go back and listen to episode 307, where we began our conversation with Jim Corcus about the making of Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. I, of course, am head lost boy around here, Jeremy. You can call me the Spider Pan, because all of us have a nickname around here, and if you would like to choose out your lost boy or pixie nickname, make sure you visit our website, neverlandpodcast.com. Also, while you're there, take a look at our links to our Patreon page, because Patreon is how we keep this show rolling. And we do appreciate all those who support us, and we do thank you for downloading the show. This will be our last show here in October. I am not sure if we're going to have any shows during the month of November, because I will be moving into our new house in this month. So... I might be a little too busy, and it's going to take some time to get my internet hooked up and whatnot, so I don't know that I'll have anything for you until maybe late November, if not December. So just be warned, we might not have any shows for a while. This could be the last one for a couple of weeks as I'm going to be moving, and I won't have time to really prepare a show. So... So a funny thing happened to publishing this episode. I already recorded everything for this episode last weekend, but the Green Butterfly was kind enough to send me a review of Maleficent, Mistress of Evil. So I'm going to go ahead and add that into the show because I wasn't going to see it. She knew I wasn't going to see it, so she sent me a review, and I thought that was pretty cool of her. So I'm like, you know what? I don't know if I'll I'll get another chance to really play this when it's still timely because... Uh, As previously mentioned, I'll be moving, and it's even been a very crazy uh, last couple of days with paperwork. And So I've also got to do a segment for Diz Radio. I hope you've been listening to Diz Radio and my history updates there. I have a big one to do today, Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and squeeze this in and get this episode published. Also, on Monday, there was just this tiny little trailer that happened, so I figured I better say something about it. All right, y'all. One more time, it don't matter what you look like, it don't, nobody gonna sing with me, okay. The Neverland Trailer Park. Um, it's an instinct. A feeling. The force brought us together. We're not alone. Good people will fight if we lead them. People keep telling me they know me. No one does. But I do. Long have I waited. And now... Coming together. Is your undoing. What, uh, what are you doing there, 3PO? Taking one last look, sir, at my friends. Confronting fear is the destiny of a Jedi. Your destiny.
I, I am I'm kind of liking how they're they're still very vague on major plot points, uh, and a lot of the dialogue in this trailer for Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker. Uh, it d- doesn't seem to be actual dialogue in the particular scenes. Most of it seems to be like just voiceover things added in. Uh, and I think we're, we see a little bit of the scene where we're going to see C-3PO's eyes gone red uh, for whatever's going on. That you know he's maybe making some sort of sacrifice uh, in order to uh, save the galaxy. I don't know. But it was a lot of vagary. Uh, I do get the impression that we're going to see maybe a uh, Kylo Ren and um, Rey team up again. Looks like they may be working together uh, to maybe deal with. Uh, it looks like it looks like just from, we only saw like an arm with a throne. It looks like Palpatine's going to make an appearance. So whatever form that takes, uh, it's definitely an appearance. So Palpatine is there. It's not a flashback or anything. He's somehow existing, whether that's a clone or what. Uh, and I I have had theories about this. You can find on YouTube about what I think may be actually going on uh, with the Ray experiment. Uh, I'm not alone in this. That there's probably multiple Rays, and uh, they've been trying. He's been Palpatine's been making a, uh, an apprentice for himself uh, out of some sort of cloning or, or genetic manipulation. Had one Ray that went to you know got taken away maybe to another planet. I don't know. There's a lot of things for us to learn when this movie comes out. I am myself excited. I know a lot of people that they didn't like The Last Jedi. I st- I enjoyed it. I'll admit there's some pro- flaws to it. It's not a perfect movie, but I still enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to seeing this next Star Wars film. There'll be spectacle, there'll be fantasy, there'll be daring do and stuff like you would never see. Yeah, we're gonna be a movie starring everybody and me. Oh, and I wish I were you people seeing this for the first time. Kermit, I got a great picture of the chicken. Oh, good. Hi, Spider-Pan, Lost Boy Eric, and citizens of Neverland. This is your eye in the sky pixie green butterfly. Fluttering by to give you my thoughts on Maleficent, Mistress of Evil. This film was completely enjoyable beginning to end. I, like many of you, was not sure where this story was going to go. What else were we going to learn? The first one had such a nice ending. But they delve so deep into the lore of Maleficent. I never ever knew that there was so much beautiful backstory on this character. This is the perfect family film with nothing too, too scary, but yet just a little creep factor to celebrate our Halloween season. So who is the mistress of evil? I'm not going to tell you. This is a spoiler free review. Find your pixie dust and fly over to your local theater and spend your Halloween celebrating one of Disney's most magnificent villains so this is your pixie green butterfly think your happiest thought and i'll talk to you next time here's the second part of our conversation about the nightmare before christmas make sure you go to amazon.com or even theme park press and search for jim corcus's books He's got a new one coming out, The Vault of Walt. I believe Volume 8 is be, will be the newest one. Should be coming out in just a couple of weeks. He's got a wide variety of books for you to, to read. Uh, make sure you check him out. You can learn a lot. He does a lot of research, does a lot of interviews, learns a lot of things, and loves to share these stories. And I think previously he has shared how important it is to, to have these stories, to write these things down so we can remember how things were done at Disney throughout the... the uh, the history of the company. But anyways, here we go. I'm going to, I'm starting this up just, uh, I backed up a few sentences basically from where we were at last week to kind of remind you what it was he had said last. But here we are. Part two. To Disney and beyond. Uh, They had people behind the sets doing this and all this. And and the sets they've covered with um, clay and then carved into them. So not only do they look three-dimensional, you get that sort of cross-hatching that, uh, effect mm-hmm. that you usually get, you know, in a, uh, uh, a, a Tim Burton uh, uh, drawing, you know, yeah. uh, style. So there's an awful lot uh, involved with this. And, and of course, 
uh, Burton is not up there in San Francisco. He he only goes up, you know, uh, maybe about ten times total during the the two years plus that this is being filmed, and and he's only there for you know uh, a, a day or so. Uh, what they're doing is they're faxing down things and sending down videos of what's being filmed, and Burton is making, you know. Uh, uh, corrections and suggestions and one of his first suggestions was no this has got to look darker you know you're making this too light and this has got to be this and and all of this and he's designing characters um but uh what happens is it, it it's not enough because he's he his time is split he's working on batman returns and yeah. so henry Selleck has to come up with with a lot of characters and 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 Selleck realizes that the film is called Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas, so nobody is going to, you know, really recognize Selleck. But this is Selleck's first chance to do a feature film and show off. You know, he had done some uh, uh, stop motion uh, uh, shorts, and as as I said, he was a a big booster of Burton when they were both at. Um, uh, Disney, and again, Selleck was a, another one of those little orphans where they go, "You're really talented, but we have no idea what to do with you." You know, <laughs> get out of here. Um, so uh, all of this is going on as as this is is being developed, and um, uh, Elfman is, is living with uh, a young lady by the name of uh, Carolyn Thompson, uh, who had. Uh, uh, you know, uh, done some um, uh, uh, script writing for uh, uh, Burton's uh, uh, films in the past. And so, uh, you know, she's hearing all of these songs, and uh, she literally says, look, you know, give me, uh, uh, give me a week, and maybe I, I, I can, you know, get all of this stuff uh, uh, together. You know, uh, she had finished writing Edward's uh, Edward Scissor's Hand, which uh, uh, Burton had really liked because it had captured his sensibility. So, yeah. so she goes away for a week by herself, you know, somewhere in Northern California, and sits down and takes all these songs and all the, the ideas and the poem and all of this, and stitches them together into you know uh, a, a working script. So, you know, you've got. <laughs> You know, a, a, at least a, a script now, but that's, you know, not the final thing because what would happen is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the puppeteers would go, oh wait, what if we did this? What if we did that? What if we add this? What if you know? And so that adds to it, and then yeah. Disney uh, to to sort of. Um, uh, uh, have insurance for their investment, uh, bring in Joe Ramp as uh, a story man. Joe Ramp later went on to become, you know, hugely successful, you know, at, at, at Pixar. Uh, but, but at this, at this point, you know, he, he's working at uh, Disney as one of the many story men there. And so he's brought in and he's tossing in, uh, great ideas. And, um, Joe Ramp, uh, one of the guys who uh, uh, came up with the idea for the Green uh, Army Men in Toy Story, and uh, he's mm -hmm. the voice of uh, Heinrich, the uh, uh, caterpillar in Bugs oh, Life, yeah. and uh, he actually designed that uh, uh, character. And uh, uh, I, I've uh, I've got a wonderful uh, uh, a book on uh, Bugs Life where where he autographed it for me, and he drew a little picture of uh, Heinrich because he was he was doing his Arnold Schwarzenegger um, uh, <laughs> imitation, but again, that was for a scratch track. A scratch track yeah. is where you you do rough voices so that the animators can understand the timing and all that, and then you bring in the real actors that will do the real track. But um, everybody just loved his <laughs> his time. Like that, even though they brought in all these professional actors to try and duplicate it, nobody could get the the same thing. So. He was at. Um, so anyway, he, he's working on, on this as well. There's a lot of different hands in there. And so uh, they would be changing things, and they would send those changes to, to Thompson, and 
and she would do some rewriting, and then that would give her more ideas, and she would send uh, that down. And, and so the, the script actually got developed, you know, as, as the filming is, is being done. So it, it's, it's amazing, <laughs> you know, that, that the film just holds together as, as well mm-hmm. as it does. And um, Elfman, by this time, was, was becoming really... Because he's writing all of these songs, and when you write yeah. those songs, you have to get into, you know, uh, the character. And uh, so he was really feeling this this empathy, this connection with uh, uh, Jack Skellington, and you know, uh, said, "Look, the the only way we can do this is if I sing this." And so mm-hmm. he he is the singing voice of Jack Skellington. But yep. again, he has no theatrical training. So for the uh, spoken words, they felt that uh, they needed to get a professional actor. And so usually what you have is you have an actor doing the lines, and then you try and find a singer who will sound sort of like the actor to do the singing, you know, like, uh, like in some of the uh, Disney films there. Uh, especially the animated films, you know, you have one person doing the speaking role and another singing. But in this, this was the reverse, because most mm-hmm. of it is, is singing. You've got that. You've got to find an actor who can sort of duplicate Jack Skellington's voice. And they, right. they found that. They found that with um, Michael Sarandon. Not Michael yeah. Sarandon, Chris Sarandon. Christopher Sarandon. Chris, Chris, Chris Sarandon, who, uh, who was... Yeah. Um, uh, Prince Humperdinck in uh, yep. Princess Bride, and was a vampire in Fright Night, and yeah, so he's scary in that movie too. My and, and, and he's also the ex-husband of uh, uh, Susan Sarandon, <laughs> the actress. <laughs> so that, that's why her last name is Sarandon, is she was married to Chris Sarandon, uh, you know, and uh, they got uh, uh, divorced. So uh, you've got that, and. Um, uh, things kept constantly changing. You know, uh, Burton wanted uh, uh, Vincent Price to come in and narrate Nightmare Before Christmas and also do the voice of Santa Claus. Huh. But but at the time, um, uh, Price's wife had uh, just passed away, and he was just mm-hmm. uh, so overwhelmed with uh, grief, you know. Uh, he... Uh, you know, I I just, you know, I, I'm sorry, I can't take on anything at, at, at this time, you know, and, and do yeah. it justice. And so Burton then looked at, you know, maybe having Donna Michi, maybe James Earl Jones. And, and then they finally settled on uh, Patrick Stewart. Yeah. And, and Patrick Stewart came in and actually recorded uh, all of this. But then, as the film starts to develop, you know, they're chipping away at the narration there because they need more time on, on some of these other scenes. And so Patrick Stewart's um, uh, narration ends up on the cutting room floor. You know? It, it's you, on you, the soundtrack. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, 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 here's the guy who's Professor X and, you know, Captain Picard and all this. And sorry, that's show business, you know? Yep. And... Um, you know, and, and then again, one of the problems they had was uh, Oogie Boogie, you know, because even though the design of the character, you know, uh, doesn't make him look like a, a, a black man or whatever, they wanted him, they wanted the character to represent um, uh, a black musician by the name of Cab Calloway, who was very popular in the 30s and 40s and was a very, yeah. you know, theatrical uh, uh, character and, and, and moved in a certain way and, and, uh, uh, all of that. But Disney was really worried, you know, is, is this racist, you know, um, uh, because, you know, uh, 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 Oogie Boogie is, is, is the bad guy, you know, yeah. and, and in some areas of, uh, uh, the, uh, the South, um, what happens is um, uh, uh, the uh, boogeyman, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, was supposed to be a monstrous black person, 
you know, <laughs> and, and and so okay, well, oh my gosh, what what are what are we going uh, uh, to do here? You know, the, it, it, we've got all of this, you know, negative stuff. This is not that. So they brought in um, a uh, singer by the name of uh, Ken Page. Ken Page is 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 black, and he mm-hmm. had no difficulty with the character whatsoever. No, gee, what are you guys doing here? And and uh, all of that. And and again, because it's a cartoon, because it's so exaggerated, you know, um, it just sailed through. So you know, when yeah. the, when the film came out, you know, you didn't get any reviews that that go, you know, ah, yes, this is the studio that made Song of the South, and you know, have the black <laughs> crows and Dumbo. You know, they're they're just, yeah. you know, no. Uh, uh, and and again, some of it I think is because. Um, it, it was a touchstone, and it was also Tim Burton, and so mm-hmm. you know that seemed to be a little more okay. We 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 can we can do that, but but that didn't stop uh, uh, Disney from trying to get its uh, fingers uh, in the pie. There, you know, the, uh, uh, originally they wanted Oogie Boogie to be um, revealed as uh, Doctor Finkelstein. Uh, uh-huh. the, the, uh, the inventor who had created, uh, Sally, you know, to, yeah. to, to love him, but it, she ended up loving Jack. So this is how he's taking his, uh, revenge. And, and they also felt that would, uh, cut costs because of course, one of the most complicated scenes in the last scene that was filmed was, uh, you know, uh, Oogie Boogie, uh, you know, uh, coming apart at the seams, you know, and all these, uh, uh, insects and snakes and things like that, you know, uh, running out of him. But but again, uh, Katzenberg had told, you know, Burton, okay, he has the final say. And so Burton says, we're going to do it this way, you know, Bo- Oogie Boogie's going to be this, you know. And uh, th- there's all sorts of wonderful little hidden things, you know, I- in the film. You know, uh, the, the two children who are attacked by one of Skellington's uh, toys – has the girl wearing uh, uh, a Mickey Mouse print nightgown, and her brother's uh-huh. pajamas are covered in Donald Duck faces. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and the snake in there looks like the sandworm from uh, Beetlejuice, yep. and there's a shrunken head that resembles that, and there's a, a, a duck from um, uh, Batman uh, uh, Returns. Yep. You know, so the, there's <laughs> all those little, uh, you know, and, and we know that Jack Skellington is a Tim Burton creation because if you go back and you look at the uh, uh, little seven-minute short Vincent, uh, there's a scene in Vincent where in the background on the wall is a drawing of Jack Skellington. (laughs) And and then um, uh, uh, Selleck, of course, uh, reuses uh, uh, the Skellington uh, puppet in... um, James and the Giant Peach as, as, yep. as the uh, pirate uh, yep. uh, puppet, and he also uses it in oh, um, what, what is that uh, uh, film where uh, uh, the stop motion film that selected where the the little girl uh, goes and there's that family and they were going to take out her eyes and... Coraline? Coraline, yes. Uh, In Coraline, there's a scene where they crack an egg, and in the egg yolk, you'll see an image of Jack Skellington's face. You know, I think I may have missed that. I'm going to have to watch it again. Yeah, I I, I know. You know, well, again, you know, animators do these type of things all the time because um, it gets to be long, hard work. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you, you, you know, long, hard uh, work. And, and so, you know, you want to, you know, do these little things just for your own uh, uh, in, in enjoyment. You know, in, in that, uh, in the uh, uh, Shrek uh, uh, feature that had uh, Puss in Boots in it, if you look closely in uh, Puss's eyes the first time uh, Puss, you know, is, is trying to use the big cat eyes to you know, uh, modify, uh, Shrek's anger. If you look closely enough, you'll see, um, uh, the Remax, uh, uh, hot air balloon. 
<laughs> reflected <laughs> in the eyes. And, you know, and, and, and again, this, this, is, this is a long, long, you know, uh, 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 tradition. You know, in, in Who Framed uh, Roger Rabbit, everybody gets so excited about, you know, uh, oh, my gosh, you know, uh, uh, Jessica Rabbit, you know, when she spins out of the car, you know, you can see up her dress. Well, that, that's just a, a, an ink and paint error. They didn't finish painting her legs all the way up. And so what is happening is you're seeing the background come through, you know, uh, uh, the cell. But uh, earlier in the film, th- th- there was a scene where, um, uh, and, and it's so quick, you're going to have to stop motion, you know, frame by frame to see it, is uh, the top of Betty Boop's uh, uh, dress pops down for, <laughs> for just a frame and and then back up because, you know, a, a, as a tribute to the Fleischer cartoon. So, you know, the, there's, there's, again, you know, as we were talking about in, in the beginning, you know, they're all – there's so many things to rediscover, you know, yeah. that, that, uh, uh, you know, we, we just, uh, uh, take for granted. And, um, uh, again, nightmare is, is, is one of those films, just like Hocus Pocus it comes out. And by yeah. the way, Hocus Pocus was released in July, even though it was a Halloween film. Yeah. And Disney released it in July and people going, why did it? They did that so it wouldn't conflict with Nightmare Before Christmas, which was released yeah. the same year. Yeah. Um, so that was that was the reason. But but again, you know, Nightmare comes out, and and again, it's it's very similar to like Hocus Pocus, where the reviews are just sort of you know lukewarm. You know, yeah. it, it, it's like, well, yeah, I. I uh, it, it, somebody says, you know, the 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 main character, uh, you know, is not likable, and the dog is not cute, and the romance, you know, is not hot. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, it took me a while to warm up to the movie when I first saw it, and I I could tell that there wasn't much for script because I mean it it plays out like watching a series of music videos where you have these great mm-hmm. songs but very little story in the middle, and it had been hyped up to me so much by the time I watched it that it, it didn't leave live up to the expectations. Right. Although I thought the style was great, and it wasn't until I watched it like a second time and a third time that I started right. to appreciate the, the, all the, the things that and, it that it uh, starts uh, to to grow on you, you know, and yeah, oh, and, and I realized and, Sally and, is the hero. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Paul Rubens, by the way, is the voice of Locke. You know those three yeah. uh, uh, characters working for Oogie Boogie. You, you know, um, so uh, you know you pay back your friends that way too. You know, Th- yeah. thanks for thanks for giving me that uh, uh, you know that job when I needed it. And and you're right. You know, and and so, but the movie made money. You know, yep. but it was not. You know that blockbuster hit and all that, but, but you're right over a period of time, you know, it just started to grow on people. And, and also, um, a a Tim Burton fandom started to grow, (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) you know? And and so, uh, those are the people I say, they must not have seen Batman (laughs) return. Well, you know, and they must not have seen Dumbo for crying out loud. You know, I I actually kind of liked Dumbo though. <laughs> see, I would have liked Dumbo if it had not been called Dumbo. You know, if it had been anything else. You know, but but the original Dumbo is, is probably one of my favorite of yeah. all time Disney animated features. I still cry at Dumbo, and I didn't cry yep. at this new Dumbo. And in fact, when I, I was told that you know Tim Burton was going to do a live action. My first reaction was why, but but the yeah. second was oh my gosh this is going to just be so dark and the the clowns are going to be evil mm-hmm. and you know yeah. uh, it, it, this is and and you know the film came out and, and the film was okay you know yeah. um, but but it's not one of those oh I've got to watch this a, 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 again you know and and yeah. and for me that, that's that's true of all of the live action remakes that they they've done you know whether it's Lion right. King or or Cinderella, or whatever, no matter how well they're done, none of them seem to capture the magic of the original animated uh, uh, film, you know? 
I, yeah. I think Cinderella, uh, directed by uh, Kenneth Branagh, one of my favorite uh, directors, is very well done. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I will go watch the animated uh, one before I go watch that one uh, yep. uh, again. You know, and, and Lion King by by John Favreau, you know, uh, he really, you know, uh, pulled a rabbit out of the hat uh, for that. But again... I prefer. I think the, it's because he was heavily leaning on the original film. He almost recreated it yes. shot for shot in the, the opening. So you know, I mean, that's but, why he ended but, up but liking again, it. <laughs> you're doing this because a makes a lot of money, and yep. and b you're reaching a new audience which may not have that connection with with the originals. You know, the, mm-hmm. you know they uh, they may feel that the originals are old. You know, this is you know. So, well, it, it's that whole uh, philosophy after uh, uh, Treasure Planet and Brother Bear and all that, that that Disney said nobody wants to watch hand-drawn animation anymore. We're getting rid of all of those animators. We're only going to do you know uh, computer-generated uh, you know 3D animation from now on. You know, no more hand-drawn. And you know, it, it's hard to to blame them because you know. When um, uh, Princess and the Frog came out, you know, and and that uh, hand drawn, and again, I think that's a very well done film, but yeah, it made I less like it. money than Bolt. <laughs> oh. I know, right? And and and, 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 and so <laughs> and so as a company, because again, Disney is a business, and yeah. and when I worked at, at at Disney, they told me, you know, this is show business. And uh, the business has to be successful for the show to go on, you know. Yeah. And and so, if something makes money, that's what you know. My feeling is you should, and Walt's feeling was as well, make something that's quality, and the audience will pay you back. You know, yeah. Snow, Snow White cost a fortune at the time, and oh, yet yeah. how many times has it paid? for itself, you know, over and over and over and over, let alone, you know, everything that has uh, springboarded, you know, uh, uh, from that, you know, and Disney's now talking about doing a live action Snow White. So, all right. Um, more power to them, more power to yeah. them. You know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just like the things that I like and, you know, uh, for the rest of this, but but again, Nightmare Before Christmas then took on a uh, uh, a life of uh, uh, of its own, you know, because yeah. then they did the uh, holiday overlay at Disneyland uh, for the Haunted Mansion, and uh, and and that wasn't the uh, original plan. The original plan was they were going to do a uh, overlay of Christmas Carol. Because it's in public domain, and and also it, a lot of people tend to forget that Christmas Carol is a ghost story, you know. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, but uh, one of the Imagineers, uh, uh, Chris Merritt, uh, pitched an idea for a um, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas uh, uh, attraction, you know, where you would go in through you know one of those doors, you know, they had the doors for. Uh, Halloween town and for Christmas and mm-hmm. Easter and Thanksgiving and all that, you'd go through that door and you'd get into this ride vehicle and you'd go through the different scenes of um, of uh, Nightmare Before uh, Christmas. Actually, the ride vehicle you were in was an Omnimover, like the Haunted Mansion, but it was shaped like a coffin. So you're in this <laughs> coffin going through this. and And then Disney thought, well, why don't we just add this to the Haunted Mansion, you know, because we want to do something, you know, uh, uh, seasonal, uh, uh, because at Disneyland, what you're dealing with is you're dealing with most of the audience is annual pass holders. So they're constantly wanting something new. Walt Disney Mm -hmm. World out here in Orlando, Florida, says, no, we're not going to do those holiday overlays because our audience is that international audience, you know, uh, mm-hmm. the guests who are coming from, you know, uh, the UK and are coming up from South America and all of that. And this is their, maybe their first time at Walt Disney World, and they want to see the classic attraction. Yeah. And that's a Disney spin. The, the bottom line is it costs money. <laughs> and, and there's also <laughs> yeah. downtime to put in the overlay and then downtime to, you know, remove the overlay. 
Yeah. Although at Disneyland, it, it, a lot of times people don't realize this, is they don't take everything out. They, they hide it in nooks and crannies and around corners. So if you know where to look, you might be able to see bits and pieces from the Nightmare Before Christmas for, you know, through, <laughs> through the entire year. But, um, yeah, and, and so that has, has become, you know, hugely uh, uh, popular. And, and uh, I, w- I was at an event where uh, Tim Burton... Uh, 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 was asked, you know, uh, are, are you going to do a sequel? You know, like like uh, uh, Jack Skellington goes to Thanksgiving World, you know, and <laughs> and, and, and all of that. And uh, oh uh, uh, Burton, with a straight face, said, "No, we're thinking of going straight to the ice show." <laughs> <laughs> and and then later he elaborated, and he said, "No, that the, the story as it is just seems so pure and seems so solid." That yeah. he he didn't want to um, uh, demean it by by doing right. sequels and and other stories and here's the sequel where Sally gets kidnapped and he has to come to the rescue and team up with Santa to do that or or whatever <laughs> you know it, it, it's fine as it is you don't need to do and and again that that's always been the um, uh, a question, and the, and the question that Disney has always had to, to deal with, you know, do you leave the film as it is, or do people just really want to see those characters again so you make, you know, another story, you know, and so you had all those uh, straight-to-video uh, uh, sequels, you know, Pocahontas 2 and Cinderella 2 and, and, and all of that. I, I, I don't know how many people remember those sequels or remember them fondly if they remember them, you know, right. as they do the original. But, uh, you know, how, you know, where, where do you draw the line? You know, uh, would I have been happy if there was just a Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, and, and not any further Indiana Jones films, you know? Well, I could have lived without the Crystal Skull, <laughs> but, but... <laughs> But it you, has its moments, you know, but, but you know the, the the one with Sean Connery. Hey, that that worked okay for me. Yes, oh, you know, that's my favorite. You know, so um, you know, six of one, ha- half a dozen uh, of, of the other. But but again, uh, Tim Burton is still such a uh, uh, a powerful force, you know, yeah. because his live action version of Alice in Wonderland just went through the roof. In, in terms of, you know, bringing in money, you know, I, I don't know if people remember the sequel, you know, uh, live action <laughs> sequel as well. And, um, but, but as I said, Dumbo, uh, again, what I, what I use as an example is Steve Martin did, uh, an inspector Clouseau film, a pink Panther film. Yeah. And I tell people, if it had not been called Pink Panther, if it had not been called Inspector Clouseau, if it had just been called The French Detective, <laughs> I would I, I would have probably laughed at the film and enjoyed the film. But but uh, you know, it, it, to me, Inspector Clouseau is is, is really you know Blake Edwards and Peter Sellers mm-hmm. and and all of that and anything else, you know. Other other actors can do other interpretations. You know, there have been other James yeah. Bonds, you yeah. know, and, and I'm one of those guys who actually liked Timothy Dalton as James Bond. Uh, a lot of people don't. I, I did. And people, well, but he wasn't funny. And I said, he has a sense of humor. You see it in Rocketeer and you see it in these other things. It's how yeah. he was directed there. But he was really yeah. good at, at, as James Bond there. Um, you know, so, you know, do you, do you let the franchise die? Do you let Indiana Jones die, or do you bring in Chris Pratt as the new Indiana Jones? Yeah, it's too bad he didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and and so with Nightmare Before Christmas, we're not going to see a sequel. Uh, we're not going to see a, a, a you know uh, animated uh, uh, additions, you know, to uh, yeah. to Jack Skellington's story, and, 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 may, and maybe that, that, that's for the game. best. But, yeah. uh, again, it, it's become a very uh, uh, iconic uh, iconic film, and, and Disney has certainly leveraged it to, to make uh, more than its money back, you know, several, yeah. ti- several times uh, uh, 
over. But but to me, it, it, it's very funny that the film, you know, does have uh, the Tim Burton sensibility. And if you yeah, look at, at filmographies for Tim Burton, it's listed as a Tim Burton film. But uh, it wasn't written by Tim Burton. <laughs> uh, it wasn't directed by Tim Burton. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tim Burton didn't spend, you know, uh, the countless hours there, you know, uh, adjusting the figures and 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 moving the these things around, but uh, you know, and and in fact, uh, Selleck gave an interview that that basically said, yeah, it was my job to make it look like a Tim Burton film. So when <laughs> when he had to come up with uh, other characters and all of that, they they were done in the style of Tim Burton, yeah. or 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 a scene was done in the style. And and certainly Burton had uh, uh, input, you know, from from a distance, you know, but uh, in terms of the day to day, you know, putting it together, that that's uh, uh, Henry Selleck, and uh, he went on to do, you know, other uh, uh, other uh, films, Corpse Bride and uh, uh, James and the Giant Peach and and all of that. But um, it, again, interestingly enough, Nightmare Before Christmas seems to be the high point. You know, in in his resume there, and uh, thank he- thank heavens uh, uh, for that. So, yeah. you know, and uh, I, I wonder how many uh, kids will be going out uh, this Halloween as uh, as Jack Skellington or as Sally. You know, uh, for that, and and again, kids at least in my neck of the woods here, they don't go out trick or treating anymore. They they usually go to you know, events, you know, at a, at a mall or a, a, a church or a, or a theme park, uh, yeah. whatever. And, and all of that goes back to um, uh, 1982 with the, uh, 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 when uh, Tylenol was, uh, had been tampered with. And so uh, there were uh, several people who died, including a child. And so that year, people stop sending their kids out for Halloween because they were afraid that things were going to be injected, you know, into the candies and all that. And so, uh, uh, Ben Cooper, uh, costumes that, uh, uh, made all of the, uh, uh, Disney costumes, which are that, you know, that vinyl mask and that kept on by a rubber band and a, and a smock and all that almost went out of business because, you know, they were not selling costumes and, but it, it it came back where, as I said, there there's these uh, uh, group activities now. Um, but Ben Cooper uh, went out of business ninety uh, two, I believe. So, and that's a memory. I don't know if you have any listeners who are who are old enough that as a kid they dressed up in costumes and went door to door, you know, trick or treating and. <laughs> And uh, I would hope we all did. <laughs> well, well, you know, a, a, a lot, a lot of these things, you know, uh, I, 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 I do a lot of, um, besides writing books, I do a lot of, uh, um, uh, teaching for various groups. And, and oftentimes the groups are, are 20 somethings and, um, they have no concept what a, uh, rotary phone is or a fax or a beeper <laughs> Or, yeah. or, you know, uh, some of these things, or, or, or I'll mention, you know, a, a, a TV show, and, and it's like raccoons in the headlights, you know, what? <laughs> and, and it's like, oh my gosh, all of this history is being lost. So thank heavens uh, 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 for podcasts like yours, which uh, are getting those stories out there and sharing those stories. So uh, that's what uh, keeps them alive. You know, oh, yeah. and and also, you know, uh, think of think of these stories as a as as your Halloween gift, you know, and it's the gift that you need to keep on giving uh, to other people, and and I hope it'll direct uh, listeners to, uh, you know, getting books for their library. Lots of wonderful uh, Disney books out there, and and more coming this holiday season, uh, and uh, in fact. Uh, 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 if you're interested in things like the story I told about Hotel Mel, I have a book out called Disney Never Lands. That's three words. Yeah. And it covers things that um, Disney announced that they were going to build, 
and never did. You know, for everything that yeah. Disney actually built or filmed, there are thousands of things that Disney never made. And and so, you know, there was Westcott, there was, it was Port Disney, uh, Long Beach, there was the SS Disney, which was going to be an oil tanker that was a five-story theme park that would go to... Um, uh, places like uh, Hong Kong and Honolulu and Australia and, and all of that would dock there for like uh, two or three months and not come back for four to five years to that lo- location. There was uh, Jim Henson uh, actually did a live action television. Uh, two two episodes were filmed but never run of uh, the Little Mermaid, where the Little Mermaid huh. is, oh, yeah. is, is a she is, she's a live actress, but everything else are Henson puppets, you know, uh, uh, for for that uh, to happen. The, the story of Hansel and uh, Gretel, the whole story of that is in uh, uh, Disney Neverland. So, you know, look at that. Or uh, uh, another book that uh, came out this year that I wrote that's been very popular is uh, Secret Stories of Extinct Disneyland. Yeah. You know, we think things are going to be there forever, you know, like the Golden Horseshoe Review. How could they ever get rid of that? If you take a look, uh, it's unusual for things to stay at a Disney theme park for longer than 20 years. And those that do usually have massive changes, you know, like putting putting in uh, Jack Sparrow and the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean film franchise into the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, yeah. you know. Uh, and or or changing other things out, but uh, we need to have a whole show about that as, as well too. <laughs> but 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 for, for for the listeners who are listening to this, I hope they have a happy Halloween, and I hope they have a a very merry Christmas, and and I hope they've uh, learned maybe something that they had never heard before. And yeah. when they look at uh, Nightmare Before Christmas this Halloween, maybe they'll. Uh, look at it uh, in a different perspective, you know, at, yeah. at, at a different slant, and uh, see that, you know, it's magical that it survived, <laughs> and it's <laughs> yeah. magical that it was put together even in the first place. And Vault of Walt Volume 8 makes a great stocking stuffer. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and and again, if you're interested in, in uh, Christmas uh, um the stories, Vault of Walt, Volume 7 is out there, and it's filled with nothing but uh, Christmas stories, including how Walt celebrated Christmas uh, at home and at the studio and the whole background on uh, prep and landing, which is something that I, I really love uh, Love that uh, uh, yeah. series and how Disney is, uh, is celebrated at all of the Disney uh, uh, theme parks and, and the Disney Christmas TV shows. So that's Vault of Walt, Volume 7, and Vault of Walt, Volume 8, uh, coming out in, in just about uh, a week, two weeks, and all about outer space in order to celebrate, you know, the 50th anniversary of uh, uh, the Apollo 11 uh, moon landing and, and the opening of uh, Galaxy's uh, Edge at the Disney theme park. So if you're interested in Disney and outer space, in fact, it includes the story of how in 1965... Walt actually went to NASA uh, at the uh, request of Dr. Werner von Braun, who was the director of NASA at that time, and Walt went into a simulator for a lunar landing module and actually negotiated, without any experience, without any direction, negotiated a perfect landing on the moon. <laughs> so, so Walt was on the moon before we even got there. Which, which is typical of, of Walt Disney. Um, <laughs> right. Thank you so much for inviting me on to talk about Nightmare Before Christmas, and uh, uh, I hope people enjoy that. And, uh, you know, if they want, they, they should send you uh, questions about Disney. Maybe we'll do a show sometime where, where we answer questions about uh, Disney, about the theme parks and about the films and about all Walt and everything else. That's a good idea. Yeah, so anybody have questions, you can send us an email at podcast at neverlandpodcast.com or find us on Facebook and Twitter. All of this stuff, of course, is on our website, neverlandpodcast.com. Well, thanks for coming on and telling us and teaching us new things again. 
my, my, my pleasure as always. And folks, go to Amazon.com or ThemeParkPress.com and look up the books by Jim Corkis, K-O-R-K-I-S. Thank you so much, and may all your Disney dreams come true. Thank you for listening to the Neverland Podcast. We invite you back next week for more fun and adventure. Until then, remember to keep a pixie in your pocket. It's that young at heart, positive attitude that you can share with others. And remember to visit our website at NeverlandPodcast.com. There you can find links to our news page, our shop, our contact page, where you can easily send an email to podcast at NeverlandPodcast.com. You can also find our Neverlanders page, where you can find out how to become an official lost boy or pixie, because girls are too clever to get lost. Become a real Neverlander. Please feel free to leave us a voicemail at 816-226-6492. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at NeverlandPCast. And like our Neverland Podcast fan page on Facebook. We also have a group on Facebook for you to join. We also appreciate your support to keep the Neverland Podcast up and running. Visit Patreon.com slash Neverland Podcast to donate to Keeping the Pixie Dust Alive. Copyright content featured on the Neverland Podcast is copyright of their respective creators and used under fair use license. All original content is copyright of Blue Band Productions and a very special thanks to Yeehaw Bob Jackson at yeehawbob.com for our new ending music. God bless! Yeah! Hello everybody, this is Yeehaw Bob Jackson. Neverland Podcast, we love you. Neverland Podcast, we love you. Neverland Podcast, it's true. Neverland Podcast, we love you.